events of the last year and a half have brought into focus the need for systemic answers to our systemic problems. Widespread pandemic, furthered by failures in leadership, ongoing racial justice issues, and increasing levels of poverty in our city. Now, more than ever, as we're all tempted to return to normal, we're faced with the task of reassessing what our new normal might look like and thinking about the policies that might prevent these systemic burdens from reappearing in a post-pandemic landscape. But how are we to select among these policies? How are we to know if these policies actually advance justice in the city of Chicago? My name is Emily Dupree. I'm a philosopher at the University of Chicago. And as a philosopher, I would like to bring this perspective to the question of justice in Chicago and how best we might advance it. Philosophy, for me, is the practice of taking the world and one another seriously. It provides a distinctive form of reflective engagement with the world. And in particular, clarity of concept and coherence of thought takes precedence. Philosophy is the insistence that what we say matters, that it must make sense, and most importantly, that each of us as conscious reflective beings already has the capacities required for this type of rigorous thinking. My hope is that this will enrich the already robust discussions taking place, amplify the voices of citizens of Chicago who are already vocal on policy issues, and deepen our understanding of what's at stake when we discuss them. So what might the perspective of philosophy tell us about the policy choices facing us in Chicago today? Let's consider as one example the issues surrounding housing in Chicago. It's well known that access to quality housing in our city is a far cry from justice. The cost of renting has been increasing, especially for residents in gentrifying neighborhoods. The pandemic has exacerbated people's difficulty in making rent, as 300,000 people have applied for rent relief, but only a fraction will receive it. And evictions have long been a source of community disruption across the city, especially in predominantly black neighborhoods on the south and west sides. Evictions in particular radically disrupt Chicagoans' lives, separating people from their communities, from their homes, from the school districts in which their children live. So clearly something has to be done. But the question is what? What specifically do we have to do in order to achieve more housing justice in Chicago? So political philosophers spend a great deal of time thinking about the concept of justice. What does it mean? To whom does it apply? What must the government do in order to satisfy the demands of justice? What must we do as citizens? And we've gotten various answers over the millennia. Justice is a certain harmony in the city, according to one philosopher. Another says it's the distribution of resources such that each person can have a flourishing life. It's a set of policies that advance the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. What all these answers have in common, though, is that they rely on a certain conception of the person. This is a distinct idea in political philosophy and ethics more generally. It's the idea that there's something distinct about human beings, about our ability to feel, to love, to suffer, to plan our lives and create meaning that separates us from, for example, inanimate objects. This idea is called in philosophy, moral personhood. It's what makes it okay to use a pencil for my own purposes, but not my friend. It's what makes it wrong for me to injure a friend, but not wrong if that same person were injured by a falling branch that had nothing to do with me. There's a special moral significance that attends being a human being, and this moral significance has interpersonal consequences. It's the moral source of the various unspoken rules that regulate our conduct, whether they're enshrined in law or not. Indeed, when we're thinking about policy decisions, what we're doing is reflecting on these moral rules and asking whether we should construct a new policy that reflects it. Of special relevance for us today is that some accounts of moral personhood are interpersonal. This is one of the focuses of my own research at the University of Chicago. What this means is that it's not just something about each individual that makes them morally significant, but rather that it's the fact that each individual is situated in a network of social and political relations. So for example, it's not merely that individuals pursue life plans with tremendous significance for them. It's the fact that this pursuit takes place in a social context and can flourish, succeed, or fail depending on how that individual is treated. Moral personhood grows within this social context. It stands or falls depending on how we're treated. This is especially relevant to the concept of justice that we were thinking about earlier. How can our understanding of justice reflect the fact that what it is meant to protect, 
that is our moral personhood, requires that there be re respect for personhood in our interpersonal lives. And when I say interpersonal, I don't just mean our social lives with friends and family. Our interpersonal lives encompass interactions with acquaintances, with strangers, with colleagues, and with those who represent the city and state in our courtrooms. We can see then how this might apply to the question of housing that I raised earlier. The current practice of widespread evictions without guaranteed legal representation in Chicago is clearly unjust from this perspective. They disrespect people's right to safe and stable housing. Their lack of oversight leads to erroneous or improper evictions, often driven by national capital investment firms profiting off of people's basic need for a roof over their head. And the practice itself is incredibly dehumanizing, as eventually state agents forcefully enter homes and demand that residents leave. This is interpersonal conduct that disrespects the moral personhood of those whom it targets. So when we're thinking about what changes should be made to this practice, philosophy can also help us assess the merits of various alternative proposals. One policy, for example, that we have seen during the pandemic is a moratorium on evictions with only limited exceptions. This moratorium has been extended numerous times, forestalling what many worry will be an eviction crisis, not only in Chicago, but across the country. Has this been a step in the direction of justice? To the extent that it has allowed some people to remain in their homes despite financial struggles, the answer is yes. But from a larger perspective, an eviction moratorium can only go so far. Eventually it will expire, and then all of the former problems resurface. In the meantime, moreover, there is still the issue that vast numbers of Chicago residents have no path to home ownership, that large capital investment firms have commodified housing, which should be a basic right, that renters today still live under the looming threat that the police department may enter their homes and enforce a, an improper eviction. So on an interpersonal account of moral personhood, the policy has been only part of the solution. Chicagoans deserve to root themselves in their communities, to have economic relations with others that don't involve an asymmetric distribution of wealth. Now, of course, this is my analysis. I encourage you to do your own. What do you think justice requires in this instance? Perhaps you'll come to different conclusions, either about what justice requires or ways that this policy proposal doesn't have the shortcomings I've described. The point is that having a better background picture of what justice requires and what exactly makes it the case that this is a relevant question for humans gives us a better shot at getting policy choices right. We can offer deeper critiques when they go wrong. We can offer solutions that have the chance of success because those solutions are grounded in deep insights about the specialness of the human condition. I encourage you to think creatively about what justice might require of us in this moment of unjust housing policy. I also encourage you to listen to the voices that already exist in our city advocating for radical policy change. Calls to lift the ban on rent control, for example, or abolish real estate speculation and massive landlord conglomerates are, at the end of the day, grounded in a certain conception of the person and a certain understanding of the interpersonal nature of human flourishing. On these views, renting as an institution will always contain social and political relations that undermine moral personhood. Therefore, they will always be unjust. The perspective of philosophy tells us that if something is unjust, we must do something about it. Let's work together then to imagine a future where justice is not a fantasy, but a reality that we have made together. This reality starts with thinking about what we as people deserve. I hope you'll join in that effort. Thank you.